My wife and I, uh, last year, received the Heroes Award for the community. And I'm here to, tonight to introduce our CEO, the speaker of the night, uh, the facility, yeah. But Burl Ellis, um, uh, as the DeKalb County uh, Chief CEO, he's responsible for administrating the county's 1, 000, 1 million, 1.2 million budget. He also manages 7,500 employees and he developed services for 730,000 residents. So he has a large amount to worry, uh, worry about. <laughs> yeah, 1.2 billion, I thought I said that. It, his staff and his commissioners are working diligently to make this a better community. And I see some of the results of it. Uh, before becoming a CEO, uh, he served as a commissioner for eight years. He was a partner in a law, law uh, firm of Epstein, Epstein, Bicker, and Green. He also uh, taught problems of uh, conflict at the uh, Georgia State University School of Law. With all of this background and so forth, that made him a great leader in leading people and leading this, uh, this county. As his primary goal is to bring these, these uh, programs, develop these programs and increase these programs and give you better service so that we have a better place to live. And so I think that's about it. Now let's uh, hand it over to our CEO. Thank you. All right, thank you so much. Hey, Mr. Edie, you, you, uh, you read it just like I wrote it. Thank you, sir. All right. All right, appreciate it. Um, thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, first of all, uh, my apologies for getting here a couple minutes late. Uh, I was stuck in traffic, and so we'll have a chance to talk about that a little bit tonight. And uh, it's always good to be back at Stonecrest Library, one of our newer libraries paid for with the money that you approved when you approved the bond referendum a couple years back. Isn't this a beautiful facility, everybody? Um, so, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna take this off if I can. So uh, th these are, th this is your, <clears throat> these are really your tax dollars being put to work. And we're gonna talk about some of that too. Um, let, let, me, let me talk about why we're really here, though. Uh, I made a promise when I ran for CEO in 2008, and that promise is that I would work with you on a continuing basis to make sure, and uh, I'm going to even move this out of the way because I don't really need a podium, but I, I want to make sure that I make the priorities, your priorities for this county, the true priorities of county government, that we govern in a way that's consistent with the principles and the goals and the priorities of the people of this county. But we can only do that by having these continuing face-to-face -face conversations. And so uh, when, when um, you, you can just put, thank, thank you, Tyrone. That's good, right there. I, I might need to go grab something, but that, that's perfect. <clears throat> uh, when I campaigned, we held, uh, I don't know, I, I lost track, maybe about three dozen of uh, in-home and community get-togethers and meetings. And then after I got elected, we continued to do that. And then after I can, took office, We've continued to do that, and we're pushing towards 50 of those just since taking office. And so this is a continuing part uh, of that discussion. Um, when, when, I, um, when, when I first got elected in 2000, after I got elected in 2008, uh, and I see Representative Darshawn Kendrick, stand up so everybody knows who you are, Representative. That's one of our representatives fighting hard for us down <laughs> at the Gold Dome. I don't know how you had the energy after spending all day down there to be out here, but thank you for coming out tonight. Um, and are there any other elected officials who I may have overlooked? Um, okay. I'll recognize them if any come in. Uh, I got an invitation after getting elected uh, down to Atlanta City Hall from uh, then Mayor Shirley Franklin. And Mayor Franklin uh, invited me down. She uh, wanted to know how she could help as, um, as I was uh, 
beginning to come into office and, and she wanted to lend uh, her years of experience as mayor of the city of Atlanta uh, to DeKalb. She understood that DeKalb was an important partner to the Atlanta region. And uh, she began to ask me what my goals and priorities were uh, for DeKalb County. And then I began to recite them. I said, you know, I've, I've held these town hall meetings. I have a good feel for what the people want. And this is what I think I'm going to have to take on first. And she told me something that proved to be true. She said, there's a problem waiting for you. And it's sitting on your desk right now. And you don't even know what it is. And you won't know what it is until you get there. And she was right. I came into office and I realized that the county was losing revenue because of the recession, which had already hit in 2008, that meant property values were beginning to fall. We weren't getting the same revenue that we were uh, getting in years past. Uh, our budget had grown to a height in 2008 of 600, uh, tax funds portion of our budget, I'll explain what that is, to $636 million that year. But, this, but the revenue, we don't get to print money and we can't overspend our budget on a local level. And so the revenue wasn't coming in and the county wasn't adapting quick enough to, to the trend that was taking place and that's continued through to this day and continues because it hasn't quite turned around yet. And uh, we, we were losing money, but we weren't reining in our spending. We were spending more than we were bringing in. And how were we doing it? We were taking it out of our savings account, our rainy day fund, what we call our budgetary reserve. And then after I took office, we began to hear from the rating agencies. Those are the ones that give us our ratings, our bond ratings, or our, you know, that's analogous to a credit rating that each of us as individuals get. And so we were beginning to get warnings that our ratings were going to be uh, reduced, and they were subsequently reduced, and then subsequently after that withdrawn altogether. We were one of the first local governments that that, took, uh, that, that happened to. And so we had to work fast in order to restore the county's finances. And let me tell you why that's important. Number one, the county can't deliver services <clears throat> if it doesn't operate within its budget. And number two, if the county doesn't have a good credit rating, <clears throat> we can't borrow money. Sometimes we have to borrow money just in order to make our cash flow. Other times we have long-term projects. We have to borrow money on the front end, and then we pay it back just like a mortgage over a 30-year period. And we have to make sure that we get the best return on our dollar. So, you know, some of us have low interest credit cards, and some of us have higher interest credit cards. And the better your credit rating, the lower your interest goes. And the county works the same way. So the better our bond rating, the better we, we get in terms of how we can borrow money, the lower the interest rates we have to pay, and ultimately, the lower the amount of money we have to charge the people we serve, and that's our citizens. And so we had to get busy, and we had to do a few things. We had to downsize government or right-size government, and we did that primarily through an early retirement program. We had to consolidate departments. We broke out just from working in, in departments. The county has, I don't know, about 25 or 30 departments and related agencies, and we had to move from those departments, and we began to operate in groups of departments so we could get rid of some of the redundancy. So we have a development group and an infrastructure group. We created a public safety group, and I'll talk about how we had to coordinate and consolidate public safety. It's good to see you all here today, the uh, men and women in our public safety, police and fire. And, and, and then, uh, so, so, so we, we had to consolidate, we had to eliminate unnecessary services, we had to reduce our numbers in order to reduce our spending. Uh, what we experienced was that the value in property, as I mentioned, continued to fall. And uh, we had to even take continuing drastic measure, measures. We looked for non-tax sources of revenue so that we could raise revenue without raising taxes, and we made some headway there. We became more innovative so that we could be even more efficient in how we operated. But it got to the point last year when we were really on the brink of disaster. Without a bond rating, we weren't going to be able to go to the market to do the necessary borrowing that we had to do to repair our water and sewer system. And so we raised the millage rate for most of our citizens because of the decline in the value of, of, of property. 
there's not an appreciable increase in the cost of, of your taxes. Our water rates have gone up, but taxes have pretty much stabilized uh, in order that we could continue to deliver services. So those are the kinds of steps that we're taking to continue to restore the county's finances. Now, the good news is that we got our bond rating restored. We got a high rating. We were able to go to the market and borrow the money that we're going to need to repair our water and sewer system to make sure that you have clean water when you cut on the faucet and flushable toilets when you flush and that never the twain shall meet, if you know what I mean. All right? All right? Because that's important. And that we begin to fix that system before it starts to break down like some of our neighboring jurisdictions have experienced. And so over the next eight and a half years, we're going to be doing $1.35 billion in water and sewer repairs. And I'll talk about that in a minute. But even better news is that we had an opportunity as we went to market to sell those bonds. And we did them in record time in less than two hours. We were oversubscribed. That means that instead of being in junk bond status, investors saw that DeKalb County is a good investment. We got a good return, so that's good news for our, for our, our citizens. And for the first time, we use a female and minority-owned firm to lead the sale of those bonds. And so never in the history of DeKalb County has that happened. And so we're very proud of that. So we're working very hard to, rest to restore the county's finances. And we've come a long way. We were down to $9 million in our reserve account. We're in the 20 million that we should be at 40 million. We're in the 20s now, approaching $30 million. So we've made a lot of headway in rebuilding and restoring the county's finances. And more than anything else, I want you to feel good about that. We're also improving public safety. I talked about how we had to coordinate our public safety system. It wasn't operating very well in 2008. And so when I became CEO in 2009, I, another thing that was on my desk was I realized I had a fire department of fire services and police services. They were bidding on contracts and not always talking to one another. We had a bloated bureaucracy in our police department. Uh, we lacked coordination and crime was increasing and our citizens didn't feel safe. And so we had to get busy and we had to fix that. So we reorganized, we really revamped our public safety department. Uh, I created a director of public safety, uh, William Miller. Is Director Miller here at, uh, at the door? There's Director Miller. I think everybody knows who he is. And then we put good new leadership over our police services. Uh, Chief William O'Brien is here. Chief O'Brien A is here. And uh, Chief Eddie O'Brien also was appointed over fire services. That's Chief O'Brien B. Is he, is he here? OK. Um, but, but we got representative from fire services. And so we've got new leadership, new management. We, we're no longer top heavy. We've got better coordination. As a result, crime is down 37% over the last three years in violent crime. Is that right, Chief? 26% property crime over the last three years, 9% violent crime in the last year. But 37%, but 26% decreases in crime. New precinct in South DeKalb, but we're not going to stop. We got another new precinct coming up in South DeKalb this year, another one in North DeKalb coming up this year. And so we're going to continue to work towards making this a safe county because we know we, it's not good enough for us just to be safe. We want our citizens to feel safe. We're creating jobs and we're rebuilding our neighborhoods. Uh, libraries like this and seven others that are going up all over DeKalb County. I hope you're enjoying this facility and facilities like it two new recreation centers, a new YMCA at Wade Walker Park, streetscape improvements on Memorial Drive, Candler Road, and Buford Highway. Uh, I drive down those very regularly. I hope you've noticed that. Uh, we are uh, rebuilding our water and sewer system. I mentioned that. Uh, creating, uh, how many jobs is it, Dr. Samama? Four about 4,000 jobs between now and 2013 as a result of our One DeKalb Works program. 4,700, OK. All right. Did you all see the jobs bus out front, the big bus? Does anybody not know Cheryl Chapman, our director of workforce uh, development? Cheryl, stand up, a wave. Everybody, oh, she is standing. That's, no, I'm, I'm teasing you, Cheryl. <laughs> all right. Cheryl directs workforce development. And in partnership with 
uh, with the National Urban League and with Georgia Piedmont Technical College and Goodwill Industries and our uh, labor unions, we are going out and training and then hiring DeKalb County citizens. Actually, the county's not doing it. We're mandating through our One DeKalb Works program that vendors who will be contracting with go out and hire DeKalb County citizens, and we're making sure they're trained to do the work and to, to rebuild the water and sewer system. So this is our job stimulus program. And the, the, the impact of that bus out there, some of you remember the old, uh, uh, what, what did they call for the library buses? What, what were they called? The, the bookmobile? Allison knows that. OK, that's the jobs mobile. Uh, because we have computers. We'll be taking job resources to the neighborhoods where our people live. We're doing that now. We have it out in front so you can, uh, you know, uh, we know it's dark out there, but we'll be doing these until the spring and it'll be light. And you'll have an opportunity to go into the jobs bus, see how it works, sit down at the computers, go do a job search, get into the registry for one of these jobs that will be created through our One to Cab Works uh, program. And then we have to, to complement that One to Cab Lives. And I don't know if Chris Morris is here. Uh, Chris Morris um, uh, was uh, in the Cab County government back in the days of Abraham Lincoln, I think. Where, where's Chris Morris? Uh, I'm teasing. I'm te where, where, where's Chris? I can say that because she's not here. But really, um, our, our county now, I mean, I, I want y'all to think about this. Our county now is majority Democratic, but it used to be majority Republican. And the chairman of the Board of Commissioners, Bob Gould, was a Republican. And Chris Morris has been with county government. You, you remember uh, Chairman Gould? Uh, Chris Morris um, has been with county government, I believe, for over 30 years. She served under Bob Gould and Manuel Maloof and Leona Levitan and Vernon Jones and is here now with county government. And um, she's overseeing our One to Cab Lives program where we're taking homes that were vacated as a result of the foreclosure crisis. And we're working to rehab those homes, put them back on the market, uh, making them available first to our first responders, our police officers, our firefighters, and our teachers. So we're bringing community heroes uh, back into the neighborhoods, quality homes and quality neighborhoods. In fact, the first home that we showcased was the neighborhood that I live in and several other county officials live in. And so there's some really good homes on the market. If any of you all are teachers or public safety officials and you're interested, Go to the county's website. Every month, we're advertising up to 40 homes. And then the other good news is that you can get a 50% discount on those homes, OK? So working in conjunction with HUD, Citizens Trust Bank, a bank we all know and trust, and other lenders, we're making uh, APD solutions. We're making those homes available to our citizens. So we're rebuilding neighborhoods. We're creating jobs. And then we're supporting our school system. And this is fundamental. And this is important because while the county government doesn't run the school system, we realize we can't be a vibrant county without a well-functioning school system. First and foremost, we have some good successes already in our county schools. And we need to promote them, and we need to tout them. Schools like Arabia Mountain and others that are doing you know, phenomenal, innovative things. Uh, the county government is supporting the STEM program in the schools. In the summers, we go out and we meet with the, uh, uh, the students. In fact, we run a program in the schools run by the county government. They provide the facilities. We provide the people. So that we provide summer programs and learning opportunities for our children. Uh, we've created a higher education advisory council. Uh, this is an, where we're bringing college presidents at all of our major colleges and universities in DeKalb County and in the surrounding area. Universities like Morehouse College and Emory University, Agnes Scott, Oglethorpe, DeVry, Georgia Piedmont Technical College, uh, Georgia Perimeter College. And I know I'm leaving uh, about half of them out. But we meet, I meet with them as CEO on a quarterly basis. We have a round table. And we've decided that we want to work with our new school superintendent, Cheryl Atkinson, and address issues related to the public schools. Today, uh, I received. Uh, Dr. Atkinson's Excellence in Education Plan uh, for now through 2017, Victory in Every Classroom. And they've stated their guiding, guiding principles. Uh, principle one, students come first. Principle two, 
Every school must believe that parents are our partners. Principle three, leadership and accountability at all levels are key to success. <clears throat> uh, uh, principle number five, I'm skipping four, is victory is in the classroom. But, but four is near and dear to my heart and I, I think to all of us. And this is, uh, this is coming from the school system, so imagine I'm the schools as I read this. We are not alone in this endeavor. It takes the entire community to ensure the success of the school district, and we must tap into the knowledge, skills, and support they can offer to assist in providing a quality education for all of our students. So as we work to build libraries and rec centers and gather with an untapped resource, our colleges and our universities, and bring them into the table, as we support summer programs for our youth, like the STEM program, as we are being innovative and building facilities, you may have heard about the new Soapbox Derby track that we have slated uh, on 124. Uh, why? Because we want to give our kids a learning activity paid for with the bonds money, so it has to be used for recreational purposes, but where they can learn about science and technology and math and physics and use that in a way that allows them to compete and have fun and also, as a side impact, promotes economic development in, in this area, uh, we are supporting our school system, and that's important. Now, before we move into Q&A, there's one uh, other aspect of our progress I want to just talk about very briefly. Uh, we uh, have uh, some ladies out front at a table registering people to vote. One of them has a red and white jacket on, and the other one has pink and green, okay? <laughs> All right? All right, let me make that plain for y'all don't understand. <laughs> this is about partnership, okay? One is a Delta, from Delta Sigma Theta, and one's representing Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority, okay? I don't have a dog in that fight. <laughs> but a couple years ago, the uh, Kappas, Kappa Alpha Psi, and the Delta's Delta Sigma K, that's right, okay, man, you just be calm now, Kappa. Okay. <laughs> nope. All right. But the Kappas and the Deltas came together, blinded us with all this red and white, and in an innovative partnership with the county, decided that if we would provide a facility, they would run the facility. And so now we have the Community Achievement Center on Flat Shows Parkway. You know, one of our showcase centers uh, providing opportunities for young people, intergenerational, in fact. Okay, run by the Kappas and the Deltas, a partnership with the, with the county. And so, I'm an I'm a Alpha Phi Alpha, son of an Omega Psi Phi, <laughs> married to an AKA, who's the daughter of a Delta Sigma Theta. All right, so we cover all bases in my family, you know what I'm saying? But we realize that all of us have to come together to promote one of the most fundamental things that we have to do as a community in 2012, and that's get out the vote. We all know, I don't think there's a person here, I'm not gonna ask you to raise your hand. I think we all know the importance of getting out and voting in November because we got that presidential election ahead of us. And we know it's not gonna be a, a piece of cake, okay? All right, I'm in a county facility and I'm in a, um, on, I'm on my county, I'm on county time right now. And I can't tell you how to vote, but I can tell you about the importance of getting out to vote. And I can remind you that we have an election in November. But we also have a Super Tuesday primary on March the 6th. Is Maxine here? Maxine, you here? Anybody from voters registration election? Okay, uh, March the 6th, I believe. If you haven't already registered to vote, uh, it's too late now, I believe, to register for the March primary, okay? And not only will we have the Super Tuesday presidential primary, but for those who live in unincorporated DeKalb, we'll, you'll have an opportunity to vote on Sunday alcohol sales, okay? So there's an election in March, and then there's a primary in July. And in July, we'll be going to the polls to elect county officials, CEO, half the board of commissioners, uh, sheriff, uh, clerk, and, and other elected county officials. Uh, and we'll also be voting on an important transportation referendum. 
And I'm going to stop talking in just a couple minutes so that you can ask me questions. But I hope you'll ask me a question about the transportation referendum. And there may be a vote on Brook, uh, Brookhaven Cityhood, OK? Depending on what the legislature does. Uh, that was advanced today. And, and if you ask me, I'll tell you about how I feel about that. Uh, so we've got some important reasons to turn out and register and vote. Let me tell you, every vote counts. Every vote counts. President Obama lost the state of Georgia. I believe the number is 206,000 votes. Can anybody, anybody know what the number was? 204,636. Okay, 204,636. All right. We've got 100,000 at that time in 2008, 100,000 unregistered voters right here in DeKalb County alone. Right? Okay. 100,000 even or, or 100,000? Okay. All right. So you get my point. The importance of registering and getting out to vote. And getting out to vote in March, in July. There could be runoffs in August and then in November. We've got to go out and vote this year. And it's that important. So if you're not registered to vote already, you have an opportunity to go out and to be registered tonight. Start now so that when the next round of elections comes up, you don't have to worry about whether you're registered. You'll be registered, and then we'll talk about voter mobilization, getting you out to vote. OK, now, for the rest of the night, uh, it's about 7.30. OK, I thought I forgot something. OK, so uh, Dr. Samama's telling me there's some seats here. I want to invite everybody standing to come on down. Let's fill up. Let's, unless you got to go. You got to go? All right, come on, come on, come on. I, I'm, I'm going to give everybody a minute to come on down. Come on down up front. Steven, Tisa, Tisa, you're working. OK. Not working, she said. Yeah, we, we, we want you seated and comfortable. The rules are this. We started pretty much on time, maybe two minutes late. I'll go to 8.32 today. But I want to respect the time. We've got to get out of here on time. And uh, uh, we'll have Q&A. As always, I'll do my best to be as honest and as candid and as forthright as I can. If I know the answer, I'll give you the answer. If I have an opinion, I'll tell you my opinion. If I don't have an opinion, I don't have an answer, we'll work to get you an answer. The more narrow the question, the less likely I'll be able to answer. In other words, if you ask me a broad question like about transportation, I may be able to answer it. If you ask me why that pothole at, at, at you know, 1692 Arbor Crest Drive is not fixed yet, Ted Reinhardt will answer that one, okay? In other words, we may have to take that one down. If you got to leave early, even if you're seated right here in front, just feel free to leave. If you got to, you know, get up and go to restroom, there's restrooms outside. Nobody's obligated to stay, okay? But we'll go to 8.30 tonight, and we'll end on time. All right, so, and if you're not registered to vote, go out there and register now and come on back in, and it won't disrupt the process, okay? All right, and we have mics, do we have mics? We have some mics if you need them, and we'll pass this one around as well. So who wants to go first? Yes, sir. My name is uh, Ramana Reddy, I'm from Suwannee, Georgia. Uh, I'm here because- Suwannee? Yes, yeah, Suwannee, yeah, correct. You're from North Dakota. Correct. <laughs> but I'm, he I'm here because I had a very painful experience in your DeKalb uh, courthouse yesterday. So I thought uh, it is my civic duty to bring it to your attention. Yes, sir. So, first, I have a question before I tell my story. Uh, what, how long do you think one should stand in line uh, while you are paying for your traffic ticket? Well, let, let me, let me uh, I'm glad you asked that question because right. you reminded me of one other rule. In order to make sure that we hear from as many people as possible, I'm going to ask that you keep your questions to one, but I'm not going to let that be your one question. And, and, uh, and then I'll respond and I'll try to do that, you know, efficiently. Yes, sir. And, and, uh, and then after everyone else has had an opportunity to ask questions, uh, we'll, um, We'll give you a, an opportunity to ask a question again. And I also see that some of you have our stakeholders report. 
And so t please take an opportunity to look at that if you can. Um, let me just say, uh, before I give you an opportunity to give me the background of your question, that uh, obviously customer service is very important to us. We've just put kiosks in several key locations in the county so that we can find out, troubleshoot where the problems in delivering customer service are. Uh, we're going to expand that program. That's in order so that we can get immediate customer feedback. So whenever you have an interface with a county employee within a county facility. Let, let uh, me interrupt you because this is, I can't, we couldn't do that because we had to appear in court first. My case was I'm supposed to appear in court first and then after they have decided on the fine, then I'm supposed to go downstairs to pay on at the location, not at a kiosk, not at some other location. So my story is a little different. Uh, you know, I can. I know that you can send also by uh, your money through email or you know by credit card and all that. But this is a different story. Now I was uh, at the courthouse yesterday, and my court my court time was two o'clock. So I arrived there at one o'clock, and then I was told not to enter the building because there are too many people inside, and come back at one forty-five. So I waited half an hour in the cold there because there is no other place to stand. And then after he, we were allowed at 1.45, we were told to, we didn't even know where to go because the whole place is crowded. You can hardly move in there. And nobody tells you where to go. There is no receptionist. There is no supervisor. So we just kind of muddled through to find the courthouse. Now after two hours in the courthouse, and after they kind of word, gave the verdict on my fine, the, they told me to go downstairs to pay my fine. So that was, it, that was 4.15 4 by the time I came down. Now you remember, I went there at 1 o'clock and 4.15 I came downstairs to pay for my fine. I realized in the long line that I was on the, I could uh, pay with a credit card because that's what it shows on the citation, that you could pay with credit card. And then I suddenly see this sign on the window which says that you cannot pay. It has to be cash, cashier's check, or, or money order. Then I, I can't know what to do. Then I asked a, a deputy sheriff what to do. He said, well, go down the mile and a half down the road to a bank and get your cash. But you had to be back by 4.30. It is already 4.15. How can I be back by 4.30? So I didn't know what to do. I said, so what should I do now? He says, well, there is an ATM machine in the hallway. You can get it. Now that ATM machine, is that corridor is so narrow. There's a long line. And you don't, even, you don't want to even put your number in that. They will be pouring over your shoulder. And you get your, you get your money. And by the time you get your money, you already lost your place in the line. And then you stand at the end of the line again. And then you know what? how long it took? By the time I went to the window, it took two hours. It took me two hours to go to the window. I got out there at 6 o'clock. Now I go there at 1 o'clock and get out at 6 o'clock. Now my question to you is that there are hundreds, tens of thousands of dollars the county is collecting each day. I can see it. I, I myself paid $400. Now, no, you could buy, you could almost build a Taj Mahal for that. <laughs> and that place is so, that place is so inadequate, outdated. It is ridiculous, you know? And this is, and we expect service. I, 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 I mean, I can't even tell you how bad it was. You know what, in six hours, I almost aged one month. <laughs> I mean, this is, not a, this is not a joke, and I'm a diabetic. There was no place to even get a, a Coke there because you are supposed to go outside and get sir, the Coke. Sir, I got it. Let, 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 me, let me jump in if I can. Oh, okay. Please do. And I just I, I want to clarify, that was at the Cape County Recorder's Court. Is that right? This is right on eight, 285. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Um, I, I'm all, first of all, let me I'm apologize for that bad experience that you had there. I started to say we realize that we have a customer service problem. And we are working, uh, and, and I saw Cla Claudette Leak is right here. She's one of the key people that's working on our 
kiosk. Do we have one at Recorder's Court? Okay, when's that going to be put in? All right, it's going to be put in in less than three months. I'm going to make sure that that happens, okay? And, 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 and let, let me tell you why. In fact, I called a meeting. You may have gotten a notice. I called a meeting for that group today because Recorder's Court is one of the main areas that we have know that we have a customer service problem. Now, I'm not, this is not a, a put down on the judges of Recorder's Court because they inherited a mess. And we put new management over Recorder's Court, and they've used some sweat equity because they don't have the revenue. I know you see a lot of money going in, but trust me when I tell you this. The county's revenue has fallen some $5 billion over the last three years. I'm sorry, the tax digest, I misspoke, has fallen $5 billion over the last three years. We've cut $130 million, about 20-some percent. Uh, I think that's somewhere around 22 to 24 percent. But we've cut $130 billion in our spending in that time. We have adjusted our revenue up by increasing our millage rate. But l let me just kind of tell you where we are right now. There's no tax increase in this year's budget. And I bet most of y'all think that's good news. But with the continuing decline in our revenue and any business model that I know of, I don't know any business that can, cons that can sustain a continuing decrease in its revenue base as governments, local governments, have incurred over the last three years and not have some impact on services. That's not an excuse. I think what you experience is unacceptable. I'm going to be talking to the chief judge tomorrow about it. You have my word on that. I wish I could reverse what took place today. I cannot. Uh, but I'm going to work to make sure that that is not a continuing problem for our citizens. And I'm going to make sure that we have our next phase of kiosk in recorder's court. And not only kiosk, because I know what happens after you pay, spend five or six hours in a place. You're not going to sit down and do a survey. You're going to go home and sit in traffic for a while. And so what I'm going to, what, what I'm going to move towards doing, and we got a new inno innovation committee in county government, haven't even announced it yet, but we're working in conjunction with IBM. And what we're working to do is to make sure that you can take a survey after you get home and cool down at home, or you get a phone call, or you, know, you can go on your computer, your email will pop up. So we're, we're working on those things, sir, and I apologize for what happened today. But what you need is a, is a building. There's no space. I mean, this is the problem there. It looks, it's a 1972 building that you want, I mean, you it want is. to say anything else? There? It's an old building. Yeah. I, I've got a public safety director, and I'm asking him to come up, and I, want, I gotta get to the next question. But it's an old building, and we had money set aside to build a new building with federal stimulus funds. And let me just tell you, it was voted down by the Board of Commissioners. So I, can't, I, I had a plan to build a new building. The money was originally going to go to one project, then it was slated to do, uh, with, the, with the RZBs, it was slated to go towards the rebuilding of, of the recorder's court, but it was voted down. So we don't have any other source of funding with the kind of revenue. We had that federal money, but it wasn't used for that purpose. And uh, right now, we're going to have to make do with what we have. Now, let, let, I'll ask you just right, last this, question. I, I have, promise one question, yes, sir. Yes, sir. There were only three windows who opened, and there were, there were hundreds of people. I got it. He's no, going to I meet mean, with that's you. That's what we need. If more windows, I don't care about the space. Sir, sir. Yeah. I got it. And he's going to meet with you afterwards. And I can't change what happened to you today. And I apologize to you for that. I'm letting you know it's a revenue problem, but I'm also letting you know what steps we're taking to address customer service. Yes, ma'am. Uh, my, my name is Camille Reddick. I live in the Parks of Stonecrest. My concern is that we've been in this community for six I'm having a low trouble. My concern is that we've been in this community for six plus years and we were promised that Turner Hill would be expanded and sidewalks would be put in because at this point we have a hazard to pedestrians who have to traverse that way. When is Turner Hill going to be expanded to accommodate the rise in vehicles that are coming through there and make it a safer place for people who have to walk down it? Okay, Ted, can you take that? I'm gonna let Ted Reinhardt, our uh, CEO of infrastructure, take that one. Yeah, Turner Hill is in the Transportation Improvement Plan. That's the regional plan where we get allocated some federal funds. 
Uh, now the whole Atlanta region has been pushing back projects over the last few years because the state and local governments haven't had as much money necessary to match everything available for the federal government. And so the whole program region-wide has, has been pushed back some over time. But it's still in the program. There's still federal money allocated in the TIP. It's currently 2014 construction timeline. The county's obligation is we've got to buy the right of way to do it. Uh, and so it's gone through a lengthy environmental process with federal money. The Federal Highway Administration weighs in. They were debating with the state GDOT and the county the traffic studies and whether the volumes of traffic would really match the plan. So it's a very bureaucratic process to get your access to the federal money, but it is in the program. Uh, now, we're going to have to come up with the local money from our host program in another couple of years to buy the right of way to keep it on track. So none of this stuff is easy. That's about a $10 million project to do all the construction because it's widening it from two lanes to four. But it's slowly moving along. It's not falling out of the program. But with everybody's tight uh, funding situations, it's not moving as fast as was originally planned. It originally was going to be built by now. Uh, but at least it is in the program. Uh, once we have enough local money and state and federal money to complete it. All right. Thank you for the question. Joel? Yes, uh, Joel Edwards from Kings Ridge Homeowner Association. Uh, my question is, uh, with your uh, 2012 budget, uh, I read in the paper that the commissioners are saying that your budget is too large and uh, that they want to cut. But my question is, uh, what do they want to cut? We, we've already been cut to the bone. Uh, what, what is it? You know, we can't get our streets resurfaced. Uh, there's a whole lot of things in the county that needs to be addressed. Uh, the police services uh, department needs to be increased. And what, what is it the commission want to cut? Now, you know, it seems to me, I've been in this county for 30 years, and the only thing I've seen with these commissioners is that, and what I, can, I, I refer to them, to them as the Tea Party commissioners, because the same things that happened up there in Washington, D.C., with, uh, with President Obama and the Republicans, the same thing has happened here with the commission and the CEO. Now, we are being uh, held without, we are being held in, 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 in whatever, but we're not getting our fair share from the commissioners. Now, what is it that the commissioners want to, uh, want to, want to cut? Uh. <laughs> okay. Um, I don't know. Uh, this is what we're hearing from the budget committee. And, and let, let me talk about the budget process because I want to make sure everybody understands the process. The process, like in most governments, in, in DeKalb County, for a, a county of our size, a large urban county of our size, we have a very um, common form of government. We have a legislative branch and we have an executive branch. And the executive, just like the mayor of a city or county executive and most other large urban counties like a Prince George's County, Maryland, or um, a King County, Washington, or, or a Cook County, Illinois, uh, the, the, the executive puts a budget together and presents it to the legislative branch, which is the Board of Commissioners. And the Board of Commissioners and legislative branch reviews that budget, makes adjustments to it, and then in our case, by the end of February, they have to adopt a budget for the county. Um, last year, for example, I proposed a tax increase. And we got to the point where we had to do it because, as I mentioned, we were choking. We lost our bond rating. The rating agencies were saying without additional revenue, uh, the county wasn't going to get its rating back. And, and basically, it was going to shut down services. So we had to do it. And I applaud the commissioners who supported that because no elected official wants to raise taxes because we know that there's a potential backlash from the community. But you do it when it's the prudent, the fiscally prudent thing to do, OK? You do it because it, is, it was a necessity. And so I, I applaud Commissioner Stan Watson, Commissioner Larry Johnson, and Commissioner uh, Jeff Rader, and Commissioner Kathy Gannon for raising their hands and voting for the budget last year. But some of the commissioners wanted to cut the budget last year in order to avoid the tax increase. The problem was when you go to the departments, they were saying, we're choking. This year, there is no tax increase in the budget. 
And we're operating essentially at last year's levels with some additional expenses. So we're really giving our departments less than they had last year. In other words, if, 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 um, if this guy was my son and I give him a dollar a week and tell him out of that dollar he has 20 cents worth of expenses, he clears 80 cents. And if next year rolls around and I still give him a dollar a week, but his expenses rise to 30 cents instead of 20 cents, he's only getting 70 cents back, okay? And because of our rising health care costs, and I mentioned all those elections, well, we have to pay for those elections. And they add millions of dollars to our bottom line. And so the, the cost of operating government, last year we had a lot of rise in our pension costs. So the cost of operating government is actually going up over time. No tax increase, so no real reason that I, I know of to cut the budget this year. In other words, the, 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 the reasoning behind what some of the commissioners were proposing last year cut the budget to get rid of the tax increase. No tax increase this year. So all of the elected officials who we fund, the, the tax commissioner and the public defender and the uh, solicitor and the district attorney and the sheriff and the courts have met with the commissioners and they pretty much are all saying the same thing. I can't do my job and deliver services to the citizens that I depend upon if you cut my budget any further. It's a, it's, it's a one-dimensional mentality. If you look at Washington, one party is saying cut, 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 and then cut some more. But at some point, you're cutting services that people depend upon. You're cutting Medicare and Medicaid, and you're cutting Social Security. You're cutting s services people depend on. And then there's another philosophy that says cut where you can. In fact, cut first, but also raise revenue in a way that's fair so that it's equally distributed around. And so we've tried to embrace that same philosophy here. We're not raising revenue this year, uh, but we're also not cutting services. You heard the gentleman, I don't know where he went, but who had a bad experience today at recorder's court. Now, all I can say to you is that it, I can't build a new recorder's court, and I'm getting a lot of emails about the Cab County Animal Services. I can't build a new animal facility. I, I can put some window dressing on what we got. Trust me, I've been down to the animal facility, and I've stood in the recorder's court line. I, I have a hands-on uh, philosophy of management, and that hands-on philosophy is, let me go out and experience what my customers experience. And I'm putting Band-Aids on it. And we're building some new facilities with the bond money, yes, with the monies that were allocated years ago. We're not letting that sit in the pot. But there's only so many Band-Aids I put on, and if I had the time, I could pass the mic. I got a department head here, and the director of the library's here, and apartment head here, and here, and here, and here, and over here, and I could pretty much go around this room and hand them the mic, and they could tell you, and it, first of all, I, I just love for you to hear the credentials that these people bring to the table and their experience, and what they've done in other places. But we're in a very unique environment, and I, need, and I, I know what you're all gonna say to me for the next hour, we're gonna talk about why services haven't been delivered, and I'm going to do my best to tell you how we are putting Band-Aids on and how we're bringing about efficiencies in government. But at some point, money does matter. And you need those resources in order to deliver the services. Now, let me go in this order. Uh, this lady's been waiting patiently. Uh, this gentleman's at the mic. This lady wants to speak. And this gentleman has raised his hand. And then I'll go pick up the rest after that. So I think I said you were next. OK. Good evening. Um, Good evening. I'm, I'm hoping that I can just read this because I don't have a question for you. I actually have what might be a workable solution okay, to a great. problem. Great. And uh, my name is Lynn Heron. I'm a lifetime resident of DeKalb County. I've also been a volunteer at DeKalb Animal Services since prior to, since prior to 2006. Um, I've worked in every way possible to try to save as many animals as possible. And uh, my, my associate and I started a nonprofit rescue group in 2010 called Friends of the Cab Animals. And the only thing we do is pull, we work with uh, rescue groups in the Northeast. She has a huge van. We pull dogs uh, from DeKalb County Animal Services only and transport those dogs and cats occasionally to reputable rescue groups in the Northeast. Uh, we try to save at least 50 um, animals a month but with the uh, increase that we've gotten in the groups in the Northeast, we were able to save 105 last month. Um, 
What I want to offer is what may be a workable solution, but or may not. Um, in November of 2005, citizens of DeKalb voted, and I'm sorry, I'm nervous. So, <laughs> the citizens of DeKalb voted on a $230 million bond referendum for the improvement of transportation, parks, green space, and library infrastructure in DeKalb. It's a shame that at that time a new shelter was not included in that referendum, but it wasn't. In looking at just the library projects that have been completed in DeKalb with the money from the referendum, we can start with the building we're in tonight. The building itself, nothing inside, was $5.7 million to build. Um, and there are also, to date, seven of the ten projects are complete, and Evans Mill, I think, is slated for completion uh, in the fall. Uh, and there were just over $54 million out of that bond referendum that were allocated for library projects. Um, in addition to libraries, there's a total of $230 million bond funding for parks and green, spot, green space. There are many large tracts of land that have been purchased in DeKalb as dedicated green space. Use of the funds as specified in the 2001 bond referendum was 70% dedicated to land acquisition for parks and green space, and no more than 30% dedicated to park improvements and development for new facilities. 2005 bonds were flipped. There was 30% for acquisition. 70% for development. And I would venture to guess that none of the citizens in here, or very few, know that DeKalb County owns and operates a horse farm located on Lawrenceville Highway at Orion Drive. It's called Little Creek Horse Farm. The county also maintains the barn and the pastures for boarding horses on the western portion of this 39-acre tract of land that I believe is owned agricultural. Here's my proposal. Since the bond referendum in 2001 does allocate 30% for park improvements and new facilities, and the referendum in 2005 allows 70% de for development, is there some way that a portion of the funding for a new animal shelter could come from the bond money and the new shelter be could be constructed on the currently owned 39-acre tract of land known as Little Creek Farm? That way, uh, it'd be an excellent location for the shelter could be constructed on the back portion of the acreage, which is to date completely undeveloped, and the shelter could be constructed using green en energy follow along the lines of DeKalb's green initiative. I understand the acquisitions and capital expenditures require the Board of Commissioners, approval of the Board of Commissioners, and I don't even know if this is possible unless it were put to a vote of the citizens, but this is a perfect year for that if that's necessary. In closing, I ask that you along with everyone else in this room, take the time to go and tour the animal services facility at 840, and I, and I 845 Camp Road in Decatur. Even if you don't have a heart for the animals, you'll see how absolutely miserable and out, outdated the facility is. In a county that is af, as affluent and progressive as DeKalb, I find it incomprehensible that the current shelter is the best we can do. I can assure you that the no-kill revolution in animal care is coming. I'm hoping and praying that DeKalb will be in the forefront of this revolution and proud to be there instead of being dragged there kicking and screaming all the way. I just ask that you give every consideration to this idea. Thank you. No, I, I, I like it. Thank you. I, I was looking, is, is Roy here? Is Roy Wilson here? Did I see Roy? Okay. Um, Ted Reinhardt um, uh, is over our infrastructure group and that includes our parks, facilities. And I want you to please um, get with him. If you're going to leave early, then he'll he'll come out and get your your name because, I, yeah yeah. I, I want to get. I want to look into that proposal. The idea of putting the animal facility out at Little Creek Horse Farm. I don't know whether that's doable or not. It's a novel idea and it's an interesting idea, and I like to explore it. Um, I appreciate the fact that you came with a solution to a very difficult problem to solve. Let me tell you what we're we're doing with um, the whole animal services uh, issue. Um, first of all, we, we realize we've got deplorable conditions at, at our animal services facility. Uh, I've toured it. I'm not satisfied with it. Uh, we took animal services, which was a part of police services, out from under police services. It's still a part of our public safety group of departments. But in our restructuring, we took it out from under police. And we think that was a good move. We created an animal services task force made up of citizens who came up with some very good ideas. Uh, those ideas to implement, for the most part, are going to cost money. We're looking at funding sources right now. There is another proposal on the table that is getting reviewed by a law department to determine if we can do it. 
mostly to rehab our facility, not necessarily to build a new facility. We had some positions in our budget as a result of the budget cuts that, uh, Joel, you talked about from the board, were defunded. We are amending our budget now, and we're going to propose that those positions be refunded. I may, uh, in, in our last town hall meeting, uh, Director Miller, I think I misspoke. I said there were 10 positions. But Joel Gottlieb, our CFO, I don't know if Joel is here either. Joel, Joel um, OK, well, we have Gwen um, Brown-Patterson from finance. Gwen tells me that it's six positions, not 10. There'll be what now? OK, as a result of the funding, 10 more animal control officers on the street, if approved by the Board of Commissioners. They get the last say so on the budget. Uh, so those are some of the things we're doing. We're working with the co-chairs of the Animal Services Task Force to identify some storefront space that we can use for um, pet adoptions, because we realize, again, how bad the facility is. I wish we could find that before Valentine's Day, because the last bit of news I'll share with you is that. Can I have your attention, please? The library is now closed. Okay. We will reopen tomorrow at 10. <laughs> All right. All right. At least they, they're, not, they're not telling us to evacuate. That's not us. We, we got 30 more minutes. Um, and the last bit of good news is that on February the 14th, we're going to have a, a pet adoption day, or what are we calling it, Director Miller? You know about that? It's the 14th through the 18th, sir. It's the what? It's the 14th through the 18th. February 14th through the 18th? Yes. Okay, thank you, Director. So we're showing a little love, okay? And uh, so please get together with Ted, and let's look at that proposal, okay? Thank you very much. Uh, did I promise you next, sir? I believe I did, okay. Uh, my name is Dennis Allen. I'm here on behalf of the Lithonia Park Tigers um, Youth Association here in Lithonia. I'm glad you all are the here. The Lithonia? Lithonia Park Tigers. Okay. I'm glad to, um, you all are here in our community in Lithonia. It was very comforting to hear all the good things you all are doing with crime rate going down in DeKalb County and all the beautiful rec centers that you all have built uh, with our tax dollars. Unfortunately, as you all know, the um, crime per capita crime rate in Lithonia is still the highest city in DeKalb County. Um, in addition, with all the rec centers that have been built that help to reduce crime, none of them have been built in Lithonia. So we are here as volunteers trying to do programming to kids who get in trouble after a swing or something in a, in a slide when I moved here 10 years ago, and nothing has happened in the park since then. But we have a lot of kids there. We're right next to the middle school with a bunch of at youth risk, and the being able to do the programming in the park would help save tax dollars that we're spending elsewhere, like in a, in a juvenile justice system now. Yeah, no, no, thank you for the question. Thank you for your patience. Um, let, 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 let me say that we're, you know, we, we recognize we're a county of communities and cities. And I work uh, on a very regular basis. Uh, we have a mayor's roundtable four times a year, just like I meet with the university and college presidents. I meet with the mayors. And we come together and we talk about issues of common interest, like the transportation referendum. We've been spending a lot of time on I met with the new mayor of uh, Latonia on Friday, and uh, uh, Mayor Jackson. And uh, we, we talked about some of the issues that we're going to be working on together. Uh, resources are limited. Uh, we understand the need to collaborate and to leverage our resources, and Mayor Jackson and I spent some time talking about that. Uh, but we can't, I think you're talking about a park in the city of Lithonia. No, DeKalb County, Lithonia Park is, is county property. There are two parks adjacent to each other. Okay. The first park with the amphitheater is the city of Lithonia. Oh, yeah, sure. But okay. behind the amphitheater where the pool is and the multi-use field is DeKalb County Park. Okay, yeah, the mall, the I've done a tour of that part. Um, the, the, the money that we are spending now, because we don't have excess money, is coming primarily from the parks bond referendum that we've been talking about. I mean, I mean the bond referendum, which was for parks, libraries, and roadway improvements. Um, the, the projects were identified at the time of the referendum, the time of the referendum vote. Uh, a lot of that money sat still for some time, but is being effectively utilized. In some instances, like this library, 
the, the library was built uh, and, and, and stopped a year before it was actually staffed and opened just because the money wasn't there. Uh, but in the Latonia area, we're doing some good things. I mentioned uh, how we're expanding Bransby Park, and we've acquired the site, and we've done the design work, and those uh, plans have been approved by the commission. We're waiting approval right now on a new soapbox derby track, which we think is going to be phenomenal. There are two local soapbox derby associations, one in Dunwoody and one in Marietta, and they want a permanent track that's going to model the national track. We'll be able to bring a national attention to an area of the county that has been historically overlooked. We'll be able to bring exposure to an activity to kids in that area. The money is just sitting there. It has to be used for a park's purpose. The associations are ready to promote it. The hotels in the Stonecrest area can support it. So uh, I just want you to be aware that there are, uh, there's, there are good projects like that, and the money is just sitting there waiting to be used. It can't be used on other things. And so it's just waiting uh, a board vote right now there's some talk about how this can generate revenue. It might not be able to generate enough revenue to pay for itself, but that's not the plan for any of our youth uh, projects. Any of the things we're doing for young people, there may be fees associated with, and there will be fees associated with this to, to support the cost of operations, but not to make them profitable operations. Here we actually have an opportunity because of outsiders who will be drawn to the area from other cities and states in the southeastern US and around the country to actually bring in outside money to an underserved area of the camp. You talked about the prime rate. We have an opportunity to generate revenue right here in Latonia by building that track. And we're ready to go. The design plan, the design plans are beautiful. I've seen it. And there's nothing like it. DeKalb County has a history of being a hotbed of soapbox derby racing. We used to have national champions coming from Decatur and DeKalb County. And now we have an opportunity to expose it to a, young, to a, a group of kids who've never seen anything like that. And uh, so we're working on those kind of recreational improvements and opportunities. Okay. And I okay. hope you all would do that, but just keep on. We've been in Latonia Park doing programming for over a year and actually have been speaking to your staff in the Parks Department and the Citizen Advisory Board since November 2010. And everybody says to get something done, you the man, so here I am. And we yeah, yeah, are graciously yeah, yeah. Ask, asking you. But, but, but let me, I want you to know how government works. I appreciate that, that's good for the ego, but let, let me tell you how government works. I, I, I was watching uh, Meet the Press on, on Christmas morning, and it was a discussion about what the president can do. And, um, and there was a comment made by Mark Morial, President and CEO of the National Urban League, and he said he's the president of a democracy, but he's not an emperor. So understand that we have separation of powers in a democracy. And there are things that I can do, but I can't do them alone, because we have both an executive and a legislative branch. I can put the proposals out there all day. Joe asked what could be done. Call the Board of Commissioners and tell them to go ahead and free the money up and let's build a soapbox derby track in Latonia and then not only generate revenue for the area, and not only, wait, wait a minute, hold on, and not only generate revenue for the area, but bring in activity for our young people. And let's, let, let's, let that be, let's not let that be held up by politics. Let's do what's right for our kids, okay? So that's what I'm talking about. And then you're the man, okay? You be the man. Okay, well, we're here as volunteers working in the community um, and looking at the model that the Cab County had that when you all did your strategic plan about four or five years ago, you all said that your model was to provide the facilities and let volunteers do the programming. So yes, we're sir. here as volunteers to do the programming, but you don't have the facilities here. We got girls in the park trying to be cheerleaders, and we can't even have them out there long to maintain their modesty because there's not even a bathroom in the park. So we're here doing our part. But we want, to, we want to work with the county and the county do your part if, if in that strategic plan that you identify, because the volunteers are here willing to work. Uh, just throw us a Band-Aid. Give us something to work with. All right. We have over 150 kids out there now. We'll be out there in two weeks, but we need something to work with. I appreciate what you I do. And I appreciate you, too. I, and I, I'll support you 100%, but understand, I, in order to build the facilities, it's always got to get a vote. And so help me get the vote, okay, and we'll build a facility. Thank you, appreciate sir. You. Ma'am, I think you're next. 
I'm not sure how to do this. Um, I know several people in the room, uh, Mr. Eady, Doreen Carter from the Greater, Greater Lithonia Chamber of Commerce, and I want to comment, Mr. Ellis, we've met before and spoken, and I know many of the people on your staff here, because we have created what's called the Stonecrest Business Alliance. It sounds as if it's business only. We welcome all of the residential that are here. We have um, started working with the county uh, about a year and a half ago, is that right, Doreen? Specifically with Lee May, who is our commissioner for this area. Um, Mr. Eady, who is here from the Parks of Stonecrest, the parks have worked with us. And the reason I'm bringing all this up is because the comment has been made over and over that we all want services, that's why we're here. I don't happen to be a citizen of DeKalb County, but I work with a developer who is a huge, huge uh, revenue producer through taxes for Southeast DeKalb County, right here in this area within a mile of where we're all sitting. We got frustrated because we had given right of way to the county because Turner Hill Road was supposed to be um, expanded. We gave right of way when we built Wesley Stonecrest Apartments, when we built Wesley Providence Apartments directly across from us, and when we built Wesley Kensington Apartments. Um, the county is strapped for revenue. We knew that, so we decided to go through all of our contacts here and see what else could be done. Because we had seen what other uh, municipalities, if you will, had done across Georgia, be it the city of Dunwoody, the city of Canton, different areas. One thing, and I'm not going to take Mr. Ellis' side for or against, but what he says is true. The county only has so much money. So we have to do our part. And many developers have stepped up to the plate with the Stonecrest Business Alliance. And we've worked with the county. We submitted with the Atlanta Regional Commission uh, back in December something called an LCI application for a livable communities application for the Stonecrest area. We, I spoke with uh, Rob LeBeau today, who is with the ARC. That award will be given next week to someone who submitted. We don't know if it's the Stonecrest area or not. But we can all do so, so much because there are numerous grants that are available. That means that if developers like myself step up to the plate and give matching funds, if the county doesn't have the money, it doesn't mean the services can't be there. We can purchase a private, not a private police car, but we can purchase a police car, which has been discussed, that's dedicated to this area. We just have to have the manpower. I heard a gentleman just say there's people who are willing to volunteer. We've been sending emails and letters, and we obviously don't have the right contact information. We can all step up and help the county. It doesn't even have to be a dime out of your pocket necessarily. It may be a few hours a month that you can help us all, but there is an association in the Southeast DeKalb area for this uh, Stonecrest area that has been put together through a lot of sweat equity. We need your help. Come help us and we'll help the county do this. The county is meeting with us. I'll tell you, I was very much, didn't want to be involved in the politics of everything. Doreen's laughing because she knows that. I was the one who stood up and was vocal and said, no, no, no. But the county stepped up. They agreed to meet with us. Commissioner Lee May put a work task group together that met with us every week for hours. There's people everywhere who are willing to help. We just need your time and effort and we can go after these grants and then the county gets even more federal funding. So if you'll help us, see one of us for the Stonecrest Business Alliance. Our website is almost up and running. Um, like I said, we are a residential developer. The hotels were mentioned. Duke Hospitality, who owns many of the hotels here, are part of that. Many of the businesses are part of that and we need the residential to join us and other small businesses. So it, I hate to use this as a, as a place to advertise that, if you will, but we can help the county help us. It's been done, and let's do that. Come see Doreen, come see Mr. Eady, come see me, and we will get you on board, and let's make, let's make the, the Stonecrest area even better. And, and give us your name so we can. Jetha Wagner. J Jetha Wagner. Okay, Ms. Wagner. Yeah. Um, you'll notice the name of that report says report to stakeholders because it's broader than just citizens. It's everyone who's invested in this county that has a stake in this county's success. And so I appreciate your, your comments today and thank you for being here. Okay, all right, yes. Oh, sir, I promised you the next question. I'm sorry, then, then I'll go.
again, my name is David George, and um, I live over Westchester Chapel, Kelly Chapel Road. I would like to thank you and your staff for coming out to meet with us this evening to listen to our uh, complaints. Now, in addition to that, <laughs> in addition to that, uh, from my research, I understand that there are two DeKalb County. There's an incorporated DeKalb County and an unincorporated DeKalb County. From my observation, the incorporated DeKalb County seem to get better service than the unincorporated DeKalb County. And I would like to know why. In addition to that, I have a suggestion. Many here might not agree with it, but from my traveling around, because I do travel a lot, I've noticed in some states they do use the prisoners to clean up the byway, the street, and different areas that need to be addressed. Because sanitation is not doing a very, very good job in that area at all. So that is my question, and I would like you to address that, please. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, I've got a, first of all, thank you for the question. Uh, I brought up our public safety director so he can answer the question about having, uh, you know, using prisoners to clean up the areas. We do use people in, uh, who are doing community service to clean up the areas from the jails. Uh, not necessarily people in prison, but, you know, some people are being held over until uh, they either um, uh, are con uh, get, you know, happen to get a conviction or, um, you know, in an interim post-conviction. But we do use people who have, I guess, mostly misdemeanors. Is that right? Okay. Um, I have a slightly different perspective than yours. You started out by saying you understand there's two decabs, unincorporated and incorporated. Uh, I prefer to think of us as having one decab. And you notice the theme of our uh, stakeholders report is about one decab. And I talk about one decab a lot because while we're a, uh, like, you know, we're 264-ish square miles, I believe, and, and we are uh, 730,000 citizens. I mean, just think about it. We're about 200,000 more citizens in the city of Atlanta. Uh, we're the third largest county in the state of Georgia. Uh, we uh, have a, 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 we're a diverse county. We're a large, diverse, urban county. And so we're a county of communities and neighborhoods and cities, which we call incorporated areas. Some of those are prosperous, depending on the, the, the value of property. The over, you know, there's a number of ways that we measure affluence in this society. And some of those are more financially affluent than others. But we also have some very vibrant and financially affluent areas in unincorporated DeKalb County as well. And so I would you know, beg to differ that we are, that the um, necessarily that incorporated areas, and there are multiple in DeKalb County. There are nine cities wholly incorporated within DeKalb County and portions of about 10% of Atlanta lies, uh, eastern Atlanta lies on the western border of DeKalb County. Uh, we are, in fact, the birthplace of the city of Atlanta. At one time, the whole of Atlanta uh, came, emerged from DeKalb County. Um, let me say this. So we've invested a lot into the infrastructure of the county, and some of the cities that have since been created through, through action of our legislature, such as Dunwoody, are prospering now because of investments made by DeKalb County. We're the ones that invested and saw that that perimeter uh, business area was developed. The perimeter CID was largely supported, I mean, to the tune of millions of dollars. I voted for it as a county commissioner, along with my colleagues. Uh, and the same thing here, while it's not incorporated, in the Stonecrest area, you know, by, by millions of dollars of investments by the citizens of DeKalb County who pay taxes here. So th there's, there's no question that we're a vibrant county, but it's not that one portion of the county by virtue of incorporation is more vibrant than the other. Now, we need new laws about incorporation. I'm gonna say that. I know this isn't exactly related to your question, but right now we've got a fight down at the General Assembly about whether the Brookhaven area should be incorporated. And I'm not in favor of incorporating that area now. Uh, there was uh, a vote today to change the name from Brookhaven to Ashford. But whatever you call it, it's divisive. It is pitting the county against the proposed area to be incorporated. It's, pr it's pitting incorporated areas against other incorporated areas within the county. 
it's, it's pitting neighbors against neighbors and people against people. And that's not good for any community and it's not good for DeKalb County. And why? Because the current rules allow what's really a race to the gold dome. Because whoever can draw a city and incorporate the most affluent commercial areas who don't get a vote, because all they're doing is creating cities that are being subsidized by commercial property. And the owners of that commercial property don't get to vote on it. So it doesn't, it, it, it's not good public policy. Because any policy that divides people as opposed to bringing people together is not good public policy. So we need a moratorium. We need to say, wait. Some of the cities want to annex that area, and then there's this move to create a new city. We need good legislation. We need some statesmen and womenship under the gold dome to bring us better legislation. So that's really going on. And is there anything you want to add that I didn't say about, because I, 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 got, I got a few people I got to get. In. Okay, now the people standing are all I'm going to be able to get in today. I'm going to ask, let's move quick, because I got to talk about transportation before I leave. Okay, yes ma'am. Okay, my name is Kathy Sly McGee. Yeah. I live over in the Harrison area, Harrison Redan, and I'm just curious as to what's being done to try and help with the increase in crime in that area, because it's definitely going up. I know I'm looking at the stakeholder report and I understand that crime for DeKalb County as a whole went down, but it doesn't seem like it's gone down in that area in particular. In fact, it seems like it's going up. We're getting dead bodies now, murders now. There's open drug deals happening at the gas stations. I, I'd just like to know what's being done to address that. Okay. Okay, I'm gonna let uh, either Chief, Chief, do you want that or Director Miller, you want? Okay, all right. Uh, yes, ma'am, one of the concerns with your area right there, you're on the border for the precinct, so we have some delineation there that we have to deal with, with the breakdown, uh, but we continue to focus. As a matter of fact, I was just speaking over here about the panhandlers up on Wesley Chapel. Uh, how we've been addressing that problem that's been brought to our attention and, I, and, and from the report I just got from this gentleman that we are making some progress. Uh, yes, you did have a homicide up there. It was a dry, random drive-by shooting uh, on Wesley Chapel uh, about two weeks ago. We've made an arrest on that case. Uh, there, there is the perception of crime throughout the county and not just to us. Uh, I've been in a chief's conference this week and, and we're all sharing information that even though we are seeing our crime numbers down, that perception's always going to be a little bit there no matter what we do. And as the CEO said a moment ago, we're putting band-aids on things, no fault of his at all. We're asking for what we need. He's given it to me as much as he can, but we got to get the votes from the commission. They've got to approve the budget that he's approved for me. Yeah. Uh, understand that you're working I know you I know you're limited with your resources what I was talking about was the area specifically Reed Ann and Harrison not up at Wesley Chapel there was a dead body found over in Main Street there are more break-ins happening in this area now specifically coming from Main Street and from Elan cross traffic there there are open drug deals that are happening every day at the gas station right there on the corner of Reed Ann and Harrison and the police cars are just driving by but I mean you can just stand there and watch them they're there day and night uh, yes ma'am I major would you get her info so we can contact her and follow up uh, we, we had a particular issue brought up at the very first town hall meeting that uh, that the CEO had over on River Road uh, same thing a, a local convenience store uh, we were able to put our strike force over there, and we've made 12 arrests, two handguns recovered, uh, and, and I've already got a number of emails on some success over there. But if, if uh, he'll get your info, and we will address that for you. Okay. Got to move fast. Yes, sir, you've right, been very quickly. patient. Well, first, I do want to compliment you on the job that you've done for the past four years in terms of managing uh, county services with declining resources. But in light of declining resources and looking at what I see as at least one of the major problems in the county, and that's the imbalance in the residential tax base versus business tax base, and that being exasperated by the decline in housing, and recognizing that you can only cut so far, uh, as we look to the future, can you give us your thoughts, or maybe better still, not to put you on the spot, maybe what you could commit to in a second term, what you would invest in or how you would invest in economic development to, in fact, expand the tax base uh, to, to take care of some of the issues that yeah, we have. Yeah, thanks. I'm going to answer real fast. Um, I, I, I'm doing three things. Not only what I'll, it, it's not what I'll wait till a second term to do, 
we're doing it now, and I want to continue and finish this work. Number one, I talked about the libraries. I talked about the new YMCA we're doing in partnership with the YMCA. I talked about the Soapbox Derby track, the rec centers. Uh, I talked about the streetscape improvements. I think it's important that we invest in quality of life because that first and foremost not only drives residents to want to live here, but businesses want to locate in an area that looks good. And, and water and sewer systems <laughs> that function and transportation systems that get people around. And that's part of the reason I believe that the transportation referendum is important to us. Um, second, um, we're re-examining uh, re, uh, how we're looking at uh, economic development. Excuse me one second. <coughs> economic development in the county. We've been working very closely with the stakeholder group, with the chamber. We have a new director of economic development, Charles Watley, who came over here from the Atlanta Development Authority, well respected throughout the state. So we're really revamping our whole model for economic development in the county. And, um, and, and Charles can get into the details of his strategic plan for the economic growth for the county. And, and, and then the third thing is we're partnering with our school system. It is critically important that not only we have a well-functioning school system, but we have a reputation of having a well-functioning school system because maybe that more than anything else drives economic growth. And so I understand that I can't do my job well if I don't support and undergird the schools, and that's why we're doing things like the STEM program, like the Soapbox Derby, like the Higher Education Advisory Council, and working with the superintendent as they work through their strategic plan. So that's my short, fast answer given the time we have. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Hi, my name is Sonali Sandane, and we've spoken before. Um, I have a follow-up question. You were talking about um, maybe looking at a storefront property to promote adoption rates, yeah. and I, I'm curious what well, that Well, to, to, pr to provide a better environment for adoptions. Okay. Yeah. What, what does that mean? I mean, I just want to, I want to be able to picture what that means. Is that, does that mean that the animals that are adoptable come to this facility on the weekend, or is this yeah. a... I, I want you to, uh, because of time, I'm, I'm going to ask, and, and I know this is, we, we talked three times, and I know this is an issue that's near and dear to you, so um, Director Miller oversees animal services, but, uh, and he'll, he'll know some of the details that I may not have, but essentially, we have been talking with our task force to find a better facility, and we thought there might be a closed facility, commercial facility, that sells animals that we might be able to readily convert because you know, businesses are closing now into a better facility than what we have now. We know it won't cure all of the needs of our animal services facility, but it begins to relieve some of that pressure until we have the resources to do something better. Okay. So that was the idea behind that. Okay, and, and Director Miller, okay, great. Yes, ma'am. Yes, my name is Joanne Derricott. And I would like to know, what is the procedure for getting street lights on Ragdale, Rockland, and Evans Mill Road? We, we have a process, and, and Ted, can, can you also get with Ms. Derricott, where you can go along, around and get a, a, a petition signed by your neighbors, and uh, you'll have to supplement some of the costs. Uh, and then you take that before the Board of Commissioners, and they'll vote on it. Uh, but there's a certain percentage within an area of, of signatures you'll have to get. So uh, Mr. Reinhardt's going to tell you how to do that, Ms. Derricott. Okay. Right here on the front row. Okay. Yes, ma'am. Yes. I have a, just a general statement since time is limited or yes, uh, several questions in one. And I know people here in this room right. probably can I, I, I give you one question, but I'll stick around for a few minutes and talk to you, okay? All right. All right. Um, I'm from the Farrington Station subdivision on Farrington Road behind the Walmart on Panola. Yes. And that area has drastically changed in the last two years since my roommate and I have been living over there. There is now gang activity where a man is soliciting young girls at the bus stop. He sits at the bus stop and sees which kids' um, parents are absent or latchkey or which girls are deemed promiscuous by the rest of the kids. And he targets and predatorily goes after those children to participate in his gang and his, uh, I guess, uh, prostitution activities. Um, there's random gunshots. There are kids out here with guns. There are kids doing, I don't know what, in abandoned apartments. Uh, the school over there, it's, it's horrible, the elementary school. My roommate has two small children. She doesn't even want her kids to come let, over let, let me tell you what we're going to do. And uh, I'm going to ask the major right here to come talk to you. Mm -hmm. Nobody should have to live in that environment. 
And so he's going to make sure that there's added police presence there. But let, let, let me tell you what we're doing, and this is, and I'm glad you, you did. I, I wish I could hear all your questions, but I want to respect everybody's time and also know the library will close. Until we, really, if, we, we, we are losing, we, we are being about as efficient and innovative as a government can be under some very adverse circumstances, everybody. I'm going to talk just real straightforward to you. And if you look at that stakeholder report and compare it to, I know some folks are from Georgia and some folks are from Atlanta and some folks are from some other places. Wherever you're from, ask your people back at home what's going on in their community and compare it to what's going on in DeKalb County. And I will guarantee you that we're ahead of virtually any other place where anybody is from. But that's not good enough. We want to do better. If we take a budget that we've cut by over 20% and cut it further this year, when there's really no reason to do it because we're not raising taxes, we've already accounted for a decline in revenue. And um, as Ted's told me, we, we're sucking fumes. Is that the way you put it? I mean, that, that's what we're doing. I got, I got some top-notch professionals working for me, but there's only so much that I can get done from these folks and deliver the services that you depend on that protect your quality of life. You ask me what we're doing to promote economic development, I'm trying to preserve the, the main bottom line is I'm trying to preserve the quality of life in this county. And the county looks good, and it's still a quality place to be, but we've got to invest we're no longer getting the dollars from the federal government. I, I know you got a question, but I got to close. Okay, so we're no longer getting the dollars from the federal government that we used to get because they're running out of money. Okay, so I want you all to understand there's no reason to cut the budget this year. Cutting the budget is not going to save you any money, it's only going to reduce your quality of life. So the big thing I hear over and over again is we want services. The budget is in the bosom of the Board of Commissioners, and so you may want to reach out and not just call the commission who represents you, but call all seven commissioners and tell them that we need to go ahead and, and get our budget adopted. And let me tell you another reason we got to do it. If we start cutting our budget, last year when the budget got sliced before we resurrected it and saved it and we lost our bond rating, it reverberated all across the United States of America. Everybody was afraid because if DeKalb County could lose its bond rating, we could lose ours too. And let me talk one last thing, and then I'll be done for the night. One more important area of investment, and that's the transportation referendum that you'll get to vote on on July the 31st. We will be voting for an extra penny sales tax in the 10-county metro Atlanta region that will be used to build transit and transportation improvements over the next 10 years. For DeKalb County, that's going to mean that $800 million over the next 10 years is going to be generated by an extra penny sales tax in DeKalb County. $800 million. Hold on, Tyrone, if you could just hold on. Hold on. Because I want everybody to get this, and it's 835, and I, we got to go. But $1.3 billion return on that investment coming back here, mostly in transit, almost a billion dollars of new transit improvements, $225 million to extend the Marta East Line out to West, towards Wesley Chapel. And some people will say, well, that's not enough. Let me tell you, that's almost a quarter of a billion dollars that we can then leverage. We can take that to Washington, but if we don't have any money to put on the table, we've already been told this, we're going to lose to Charlotte. We're going to lose to Seattle. We're going to lose to Phoenix. We're going to lose to Miami. We're going to lose to the Northeast Corridor. We're going to lose to all these other communities because there's not enough money anymore to give to every major metropolitan area throughout the United States. Over and over again, President Obama and his cabinet have told us, Atlanta, and that means DeKalb County too, Atlanta region, get your act together. And so we have an opportunity to get 21% of the regional transportation dollars back here in DeKalb County. And that's enough reason, as much as anything else, for us to run to the polls and support this referendum. I'm going to tell y'all, you're going to hear people say crazy things like this. 
I'm not getting everything I want, therefore I don't want any of it. Now, you might want to be, live in a $500,000 house. I've said this over and over again. But maybe you can afford to live in a $150,000 or $200,000 house. And that's, that ain't bad. You're going to be homeless for the next 10 years until you can afford the $500,000 house, or you're going to be reasonable and buy the $150,000 house today and make that investment, build some equity, so that in 10 years from now, you can live in the house you want to live in. And that is the dilemma that we're faced with right now. In politics, mature politics especially, but in life in general, we know that we don't get, always get everything we want the first time. We go to God in prayer, and we're thankful for what we get, and we build on it. And we have an opportunity to build. But if we say no to the referendum simply because we, and by the way, nobody got everything they wanted, okay? DeKalb County is getting more than every other county. But if we say no simply because we didn't get everything we want, we will get nothing. We have an opportunity to get something significant. So that's where we stand. That's how our future can be built. Thank you all for being here together. We have a future to work towards. Let's do it together. Thank you all. Have a good evening.